The Amidyar Foundation has funded many different kinds of organizations. Um, in this particular Gov2.0 space, uh, there have been a number of recent investments which have particular resonance um, with the community, specifically around cities. Uh, one of them, as uh, we just were talking about, is Code for America. Uh, what do you see there? What caused you to um, make that particular um, play? Well, Code for America, I think, is a really exciting example of getting people engaged with government. Both the coders, who will be the fellows that will be implementing projects across the five cities, as well as citizens who really haven't had the opportunity to get uh, engaged with city government the way uh, they would like to. And um, we like to foster organizations that really promote engagement among citizens and government, and Code for America is the perfect example. Uh, what other kinds of organizations or what specific organizations uh, have you also seen that are making a difference in that regard? Well, the Sunlight Foundation, uh, which is one of our core grantees, uh, has a terrific history of getting citizens engaged with government. Uh, again, uh, not only citizens who are just interested in the topics, but also coders themselves. They've done a great job at getting a volunteer community of uh, developers to just scrub government data nights and weekends because they're passionate about it. Uh, and so, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing what Sunlight does going forward. When you look at an organization like Sunlight or look at the potential of, of Code for America, um, what are the, the metrics for um, engagement or success on that kind of uh, citizen participation that you look for? Um, it depends on the organization, but um, because we support technology platforms, we look at reach and engagement and policy slash influence of organizations. So we look at everything from web metrics like monthly unique visitors to the sites um, to uh, engagement. Uh, for example, with Code for America, we'd like to see you know, the number of cities that participate grow uh, over time mm -hmm. uh, because we're really looking for that kind of supply and demand engagement, both from governments and from citizens. And there's been a great deal of useful discussion about the digital divide recently um, because of this particular space where um, sometimes the, uh, the mobile applications, the uh, web services, the um, really uh, shiny, flashy things that can come from this um, are not always accessible to people if they don't have higher speed access. Um, to what extent is uh, the Meteor Network looking at digital divide issues and, and where might some of those um, differences be um, solved or mm -hmm. at least work towards? Oh, Meteor Network does a lot of work in the developing world as well as in the U.S. Uh, and obviously mobile is the kind of key technology there. So organizations we support like Ushahidi and Frontline SMS use text messaging and mobile platforms to enable everyone to be able to access technology for the greater good. And uh, looking forward to hearing more about Ushahidi later today um, and looking towards building a better state. Um, and, and have you seen that the uh, deployment of SMS text messaging has really made a difference in terms of uh, transparency or citizen participation in uh, those areas? Um, we're starting to see that. I mean, it is a technology that you know far greater penetrates the developing world uh, than obviously smartphones or uh, regular online access. Uh, so to us it seems like the best place to start. Uh, it's not perfect and obviously penetration rates uh, even of texting need to get better so that everyone can have access, but it seems like the logical place to start. Are you looking at places uh, like um, mobile funding? Because I know that um, M-Pesa has obviously been a very big deal in, in Africa, and now people are starting to look at the mobile donation areas. Is there anything uh, there in terms of an emerging technology that you all are looking towards? Um, we do have an investment area called Access to Capital mm -hmm. um, that looks at uh, things like entrepreneurship, microfinance, and property rights all in the developing world. Uh, and as part of that, we are starting to look at the mobile payment space uh, as a potential investment area. And uh, bringing it back to the United States, in, in terms of this um, developing ecosystem between the release of open government data and then the citizens' use of that, um, where are the holes, so to speak? People look at, they look at uh, application ecosystems. Um, where are the places where um, more, more funding or development activity would make a real difference in terms of the outcomes? I think um, one of the big holes is really in citizen awareness. Um, most people living their daily lives don't necessarily 
um, think about government data on a daily basis and why it's important to them and why transparency is so key. So, um, you know, getting people to care and to engage at the local level, at the state level, at the national level uh, is really, I think, the biggest opportunity for transparency right now. Is that something that um, the media should be looking towards? In terms of raising awareness? Absolutely. Okay. I think anything we can do to um, get people excited um, or concerned, uh, whichever motivates them to get involved, I think would be a great thing. And the media can do a terrific job in helping spur that. I, I know that in terms of uh, talking with other uh, people who cover this space, they see that the um, interest in stories about government data is dramatically different than stories about uh, com companies' private data mm -hmm. and trying to understand what the, the sentiment difference is and then how to uh, stimulate that interest. And it's re especially relevant right now because of the launch yesterday of challenge.gov. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the issues with that particular play is if people aren't aware of it, then they won't go there to use it. So there's a, this kind of um, need to start that positive feedback cycle. Um, when you look at the uh, sort of state of play of uh, new media startups, um, what are some of the things that you're hopeful for in terms of, uh, I know uh, uh, that uh, Pierre Omediar uh, has started uh, supporting uh, something out in Hawaii, which uh, looks like it ha might have some promise for covering uh, that state a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Um, well, Civil Beat, which is Pierre's venture in Hawaii, is all about uh, getting people to have a civil dialogue. One of the things that seems to be missing or really disintegrating in civil discourse, civic discourse today is the ability to have a conversation without uh, fear and anger and rhetoric um, getting in the way. And so um, what, what we'd all like to see at Civil Beat and elsewhere um, is that ability to get people to engage in dialogue around facts and issues instead of emotions because emotions um, really take away the ability to have a rational conversation and get to the bottom of issues. In, um, in terms of this really sticky issue of authentication and identity, um, is it important that citizens um, interacting across the board at the different uh, startups, whether uh, it's uh, news or citizen engagement or uh, uh, something like a crowdsourcing website, that they do so under their own names that are authenticated, or is there room for anonymity in that space? I think it depends on the context um, that's being used. If you're engaging deeply in a political discussion, uh, there is a need to identify yourself because that's part of what keeps people um, behaving. Uh, if you are you know, crowdsourcing an instance of election violence in Kenya using the Ushahidi platform, uh, not so important necessarily to identify your specifics and in fact you know, might be um, somewhat dangerous. So it really depends on the context in which you're using technology. I think that's something that um, there's some concern in, in uh, advocates of the use of technology in autocratic regimes, that it could be used to trace back to the people who are the ones sharing the information very quickly. Uh, it's something you can see happen in Iran, for instance. So there's this uh, balance between getting involvement versus exposure. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, the next uh, places you're going to go uh, or focusing upon, what are some of the uh, emerging technologies or companies uh, around the world that have caught your eye? Um, well, we're always looking for scalable platforms that allow citizens to engage. So what I'm seeing right now are a lot of um, small efforts to take specific data sets uh, and make them more manageable or useful to people. Um, and what I'm looking for in addition to that is platforms that can link together multiple data sets, uh, or multiple functionalities uh, that can really scale because the power of technology and what we're really focused on at a Midair Network uh, is scalable platforms so that hundreds of thousands or even millions of lives can be touched.